being recorded, guys. Hi, I am Steph, and this is Lisa. Together, we're PD Connect, and we're so happy that all of you are here today. I'm going to leave you a little bit about Dr. Oaken. Uh, here we go. Dr. Michael Oaken is a world-renowned Parkinson's advocate, researcher, author, and educator. Dr. Oaken is an expert in deep brain stimulation, DBS for Parkinson's, and he is an Adelaide Lackner professor and chair of the neurology at University of Florida. Dr. Oaken and his team run one of the largest DBS troubleshooting clinics in the world. PD Connect and Silicon Valley Parkinson's Women's Support Group are honored to have him as our guest here in our Zoom meeting today. Thank you guys so much for coming and here is Dr. Oaken. Let's make him the spotlight. Uh -oh. okay. Right. Hello, everybody. There we go. See everybody here. I see a few familiar faces across the group here. Darcy Blake, who I've corresponded with here in the past, and uh, of you, I think we've met either on the road or or um, maybe in correspondence. But it's really nice to reach out, and I know that you all are having your own crisis with some wildfires there. So I'm wishing everybody well and and hoping that that comes under control you know just as soon as possible and it seems like 2020 is the year of crises and um and so you know with that I, i'm gonna try to keep your attention and maybe try to keep things a, a, a little bit uh brief i'll share some slides and tell you about some of the new projects that we've been up to and i have uh, a list of questions that were um, submitted to me by PD Connect in the group, which I super appreciate. And, um, and I'm happy to do those or to answer questions live. And so this is really meant to be an hour that we can have a little bit of fun together. So can, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yep, okay, all right, so we have, okay, now what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try to optimize my screen here and, uh, and see if you can, uh, if you can see the PowerPoint slides, can you see the PowerPoint slides now? Not yet, no. No, you can't see them? Okay. Yeah. All right, let's try right now. Yes. Um, yes? Yes. All right, good. Just give me a shout if, if you don't see them or if they're not moving. Um, can you still see them? Yep. Okay, so it's, it's a living living uh, with Parkinson's disease and ending Parkinson's disease. And these are two projects. Right and, now, sorry, Dr. Ogan, you are on your web browser page instead of the PowerPoint. Okay, so we're moving. So it looks like when I shared, it moved it to a different screen. So let me try this again. Hmm. I'm going to try to move it over to this screen time. Can you see it? Gonna, this is always a really challenge here with Zoom. Okay, let's try this again here. All these college degrees are not really helping me. Well, let's try again here. Okay, we're going to optimize and I'm going to go for this screen this time. All right, and yes, slides there. Okay, now I'm going to go into presentation mode and see if it doesn't crash on us. You got it now? Got okay. it. Thank you. Put the screen in presentation mode. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about living with Parkinson's disease and ending Parkinson's disease. And really, this hour is really for you. And so I'll try to be brief and maybe just challenge you a little bit with some of the things that we've been thinking about and. To groups without coming with um, with something you know in my pocket to tell you that may uh, affect or impact your lives and so so thanks for inviting me and again I have interacted with a number of you in the past and I know that this is a really active um, group of uh, people with Parkinson and family members and and so it's great to great to be connected. I do have a Twitter handle. I'm, uh, I don't know if I'm proud or, or, or a little bit shy to say that, but, um, but you feel free to tweet me at Michael Oaken if you have questions. And then we also have a blog at parkinsonsecrets.com and one of your 
Californians at UCLA has joined me in that blog effort. Um, somebody that specialist in integrative medicine and do Subramanian. And we've been interviewing a lot of experts and trying to put content up every week, especially during Corona where everybody's kind of stuck at home. So feel free to log on and check it out. Um, we had Renee Fleming, the, um, the famous singer this week talking about Parkinson and music, uh, but we had a lot of interesting blogs on different topics. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about two books that have uh, come out here literally uh, at the beginning during the, the pandemic. The, the first one, the Ending Parkinson's Disease book, A Prescription for Action, what our thoughts are on, on that. And the, the second book, Living with Parkinson's Disease, is a book that was actually um, put together by um, Robert Rose. And Robert Rose is a, uh, a famous uh, um, book uh, publisher for um, books that uh, are cookbooks. And so many of you have them in your kitchen. And so they helped us really with organizing content and helped us to try to put something together that would make sense and, and really help people to guide them through their lives. And so we're, we're, we're super excited to work with them on that project. We have done the impossible before. The suffering we experienced, it pushed us forward. It did not stop us. Stigma was there. Our brothers and sisters marched on the streets until it wasn't. The challenge inspired us. Together, we rose to the occasion. We fought back. And we will do it again. We will end Parkinson's. Our fight begins now. We have done the... So this is the trailer that appeared with the book. And the question comes up uh, when we began to write this was how big is the problem? And it turns out that Ray Dorsey and um, at the University of Rochester, who many of you may know, Todd Scherer, who's the CEO of the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and um, also Boston Bloom, who's a, an expert neurologist in the Netherlands. The four of us got together and we began to look at data and try to understand not only how big the problem was, but what can we do about it? What's the formula? What's the prescription? What are we going to do? And when you look at it from this perspective, you realize that um, Ray sat on the board with the World Health Organization. And actually, we had a meeting with the World Health Organization, which has taken up Parkinson as one of its um, areas of interest that was canceled because of corona here in July. But Parkinson disease is now the fastest growing neurological disorder. And that should blow your mind a little bit and really make you think about uh, what are we going to do about it. And, and if, you, if you think just in simple terms, so if you were in a classroom and when you're growing up, a classroom has 25 or 30 people in it, two of the people that you know, either you and someone else or two of your friends or two of the people in that class are going to end up in a lifetime getting Parkinson's. And so that, that should be something that I think we should all um, care about. And when we looked at the projections, and these were put together by Ray Dorsey, who's quite an expert in this uh, field. If you look at 25 year epics, so if you look between the years of 1990 and 2015, it more than doubles to over 6 million people. This is in the world's most populous countries. And there's, there's a lot more people probably than are represented by this, but I think this is a fair uh, underestimation. And then if we look at what's gonna happen in the next 25 year epic from 2015 to 2040, it's gonna more than double. And so this has the potential to wreak all sorts of havoc, not just the suffering symptoms and the, and the issues that individuals and families are gonna deal with, but also healthcare systems. And we say it has the potential to, uh, to bankrupt uh, healthcare systems. 
Now, the lifespan has actually doubled in the last 100 years, and people talk about this as being the greatest advance of the last 100 years, and it's not the iPhone. I'm sorry to disappoint some of you because I know that this is a group in Silicon Valley, but it's actually quite remarkable that as humans, we can now double the lifespan. And so you can look at these types of graphs that show in the 1850s people lived below the age of 40 on average and now living up above a five. So this is huge. And people have automatically attributed the growth of diseases like Parkinson to being uh, degenerative. And that because it's degenerative, age is the risk factor that's driving it. But we know if you actually correct for age, which we've done, age is not the only factor and there must be other invisible factors that we don't yet understand. Now, there are several myths that we talk about uh, in the book uh, about Parkinson's disease. Uh, the first is, of course, that it's all due to aging. We know that that is not true. We also know the myth that it's not treatable is also something that um, is just absolutely heartbreaking when we're giving the diagnosis of Parkinson and the majority of people worldwide aren't seeing experienced neurologists, not just neurologists, but people who have seen some Parkinson and understand this isn't Alzheimer's, this isn't ALS. It's actually a treatable disorder and there's a path to a happy and meaningful life. And this idea that there's nothing to be done about the risk of getting Parkinson's disease later in your life is also a bit fictitious given the fact that now we have dozens and dozens of studies that are telling us something about you know, risk associations uh, between uh, different factors that may be important. So talk about the Parkinson pandemic for a moment. And I will tell you that the original title of the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease, was the Parkinson pandemic. It was a term that was extracted from a book that we wrote a number of years ago in 2013, so seven years ago, uh, we talked about Parkinson's disease being a pandemic. And the reason that we talked about it is, is, is that clearly it's a non-infectious entity, but it had many of the um, common characteristics that you would see uh, in an infectious pandemic. Pandemics extend over large geographical areas. Check, Parkinson's does that. They tend to migrate. The burden shifts in responses to changes in aging and industrialization. Check that box. There's exponential growth you know, with a pandemics. Also, check that box. And no one is immune to the condition. So again, a full on all the criteria are there. We agree with the World Health Organization that the word pandemic should probably be reserved for infectious diseases of which we don't believe Parkinson is one, although there are infectious theories of Parkinson. Now, we know that the word comes from a Greek derivation. So um, pan means all and demos means people. So of all people. So in the 1800s, when they started to use this name, it wasn't reserved uh, just for infectious diseases. Now, I don't think it's worth debating whether we should use the word pandemic. And we actually had named the book Ending Parkinson's Disease, The Parkinson Pandemic, but the publisher had us change that name to Ending Parkinson's Disease, a prescription to action. And um, had we left it as pandemic, we probably would have done better with our book sales, which, which all, by the way, go to Parkinson charities. So what's the next step for Parkinson? What do we need to do. And so what we did as a group of four authors is we studied other diseases. So what are these other diseases? We studied polio, we studied HIV, um, we studied breast cancer, and we tried to understand what it was that made those uh, successes to moving the ball toward ending the disease. And you'll notice the title is Ending the Disease, a Prescription for Action. So what could we do to try to move that needle. We must learn from other diseases. And we purposely chose a title that was a bit provocative. None of us believe that we're gonna end Parkinson's disease with a light switch, but we do believe like other diseases that we've gotta get on the train. So what have the other diseases done, like polio and HIV and breast cancer? Well, if you look carefully at their path, and we examine this 
uh, within the book, it is uh, really a, what we call a pact. Prevent the disease, strong advocacy, caring, and developing new treatments and research strategies. That's the trick that has led to these improvements. And so let's talk about some of those things. The first being prevention. And when we think about prevention, we think about are there factors in the environment, you know, maybe pesticides or chemicals or things that could be um, altered and those things might be, um, be triggering the Parkinson processes. And so we think about environment. We think about non-pharmacological or non-device related issues like exercise, rehabilitation, other things. Could that either prevent or could it slow down the disease? We don't know and drugs and devices. And so there's a lot of interest in that area, but really the one that we have the most information on today is in the environment. And we know when it comes to things in the environment like pesticides that we should be beginning this conversation about banning specific pesticides and banning specific chemicals. The word pesticide, by the way, is a Latin root. So side means killer. And what's in front of killer tells you what the chemical or what the, the pesticide, um, um, and no pun intended, is meant to target. So it could be a fungicide or an insecticide. The one that we should really key in on first is this one that you may have in your garage called Paraquat. It is the pesticide that has the strongest link to Parkinson disease. It's been banned in 32 countries, including China, but in the US, its use has doubled in the last 10 years. And we know that lots of paraquat exposure increases your risk of the later, a potential later emergence of Parkinson. Doesn't mean everybody who gets paraquat in a certain dose gets Parkinson, but when we look at a population, we see a very strong relationship. And so if we were going to Las Vegas, we call these odds ratios, and the bets are getting very good on certain of these pesticides and chemicals. And you can see the use has been increasing and even somewhat doubling here. This is the 2016 in gray bar. And then you can see where the paraquat is in the United States. And you can see there's a little, you know, sort of strip here in California. So you all get it because it tends to be around agricultural regions. So I ask you, where do you live? And I assume since you're called the Silicon Valley uh, Parkinson uh, group that you live either close to Silicon Valley. And there are these sites all over the United States that are called Superfund sites. That's where there's some sort of chemical pesticide or something in the environment that the government has agreed that it is uh, time to clean it up and that they're going to fund cleaning this up, although many of them are not cleaned up. There are 23 such sites, if you look this up, in the Silicon Valley region. That's quite a number, um, so um, that, that is something of worry. Um, my particular house here, I live, I, I live in a liberal college town, uh, which we like very much, called Gainesville, Florida, where the great University of Florida lives. It's a, a house of 50,000 students. And my house, um, which is not on the campus, is about 11 miles from a Superfund site that has dioxin, which is one of the components of Agent Orange. It's actually next to one of my favorite pizza joints. And the Agent Orange was shipped in these orange barrels. That's why they call it Agent Orange. It's actually the toxin isn't actually orange. And of course, many of you know you can get benefits through the VA if you had significant exposure and developed Parkinson disease. And so a very strong link now is being shown in multiple studies. The other one that has an enormously large risk of the later development of Parkinson is called trichloroethylene or TCE. It's commonly used as a degreaser or in dry cleaning. It's been known for many years. This was a letter in the journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, all the way back to 1932, talking about the failure to disclose the toxic nature of these chemicals, trichloroethylene, of, oftentimes in blue barrels, if that helps you to remember it. But again, 
these are chemicals that are associated with a very high risk of the later development of Parkinson. So that's the P, prevent. Let's shift to the A, advocate. And we ask ourselves, what did we learn from other diseases like polio and like HIV? Well, here um, pictured is Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who if, if you all read the papers um, yesterday, you see that one of the presidential candidates was in um, Georgia, talking about Warm Springs, Georgia, where FDR went to recover. But actually, one of the great stories of polio was that FDR was its greatest advocate. And in fact, the March of Dimes received its name because people mailed dimes to the White House. You can see the famous comedian Eddie Cantor here and the importance of advocacy for changing the trajectory of this disease that has been largely eradicated uh, from uh, the planet, at least according to the World Health Organization. HIV is another great example. Here's um, many of the advocates went to very uh, extreme and uh, aggressive tactics, which is very important to move that needle and get enough funding and enough recognition to your disease. Here they put a condom over one of the lawmakers' houses, Jesse Holmes, who kept voting against their their uh, legislation for HIV. He never voted for, he never voted against them again after they slipped this huge condom over his house that said a condom to stop unsafe politics, Helms is deadlier than the virus. The HIV researchers also seized control of the Food and Drug Administration. They um, had great quilts out on the Washington Mall and they really galvanized the community. They were aggressive say they were charismatic. And this is what it takes for a serious advocacy effort. So how do we grade our response in Parkinson? Well, I'm not going to say that there aren't a lot of people like the Silicon Valley Parkinson group out there, because that would be insulting to you to say that, that there aren't people out there advocating. I think there are a lot of people out there advocating with a lot of organizations like Parkinson Foundation, Michael J. Fox, and APDA, and Davis Finney and, and, and all of the great groups um, that are all over this country and all over the world. But so far, the disease continues to grow unchecked. So I don't think we can give ourselves an A plus on our performance. And I would say uh, after studying a lot about polio and HIV and breast cancer, that it's time for us to rethink uh, how our advocacy efforts should be going. We should probably be more aggressive and more charismatic. Now the C in PACT, we did prevent, advocate, that's the P and the A. The C is for care, and we have to think about care topics. And this is a book that we just put out with Irene Malati, who's just a tremendous neurologist here at UF, and one of our former fellows who was on staff here with some deep, has just taken over at University of Massachusetts and has his own program there now. Um, just a terrific, terrific neurologist, and, and both of them are really amazing. And this book got caught in COVID and it was actually done and in the, um, it was in the warehouses. It was kind of this tragedy where no, nobody could get to it because the warehouses were shut down with Robert Rose and all the publishing houses. And so finally it's been out the past few weeks and it has a lot of good tips. It's in uh, a very easy readable uh, format and uh, it's super important. And so when I think about care, I think about a few things. And one of them is, is, is that this old fashioned picture by Gowers in one of the neurological textbooks, William Gowers of the Parkinson man that looks pathetic. This is not the picture of Parkinson. And in fact, Melissa Armstrong and I published this piece in JAMA Neurology a few months ago, talking about you know, how people live with Parkinson. They're on and they're off times, different uh, phenotypes, and not everyone looks like the Gowers man. So we have to throw this picture away and I'm telling all the people that do slides and presentations on Parkinson to throw this picture away and start to show these newer images that also include motor as well as non-motor symptoms. And so when we think about living with Parkinson, think about all the people that are doing it successfully. This is Bob Dean. He um, took pictures of lots of people with Parkinson and they're featured both in the ending Parkinson book, but also in the Living with Parkinson book in every single chapter, showing the real faces of people that are living and fighting and bringing the, the strategy you know, to, uh, to the next generation. And so when we think about care, there's a lot of 
of tips and I'm just going to hit a few for you that I find useful. This is a quote from Joshua Harris about the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. And one of the big tips I always tell people is be really careful about looking for the next new therapy because a lot of times you can do so much better if you have the medicine or the therapy in the right time and the right sequence and the right plan continuously throughout your year being adjusted by your care team can be way better than any purple or, or brown you know, pill or whatever the newest thing out there is. Parkinson is a disease of a group of circuits in the brain that I've studied for my whole career. And we build things in our lab to try to control these circuits, but it's a, it's a disease of cueing and of timing. And so having the timing right is so important. So if you, things aren't changing over time, with your doctors, you, you should think about both with them and your and your care team, are you on the right strategy? Because timing things is super important. We also know that exercise and rehabilitation is really important. And we've learned some really great lessons like bad therapy is worse than no therapy at all. We can actually make people fall if they get the wrong therapy. If you're coughing when you're eating, this should prompt evaluation because you might be putting food down into the lungs and that is not good. And we've also learned that taking six weeks of Medicare's uh, benefits and running them out and not having therapy for the rest of the year is a bad idea. It's better to have, to have your therapy spread out. Remember, it's the timing of the disease. And so bursts of therapy are not as good as either even um, having exercise therapists, having um, personal trainers, using your physical therapy, uh, throughout uh, the course of a year seems to be better than doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that we're learning about is nutrition. And super important that we begin to, to take this journey. And we have not gone there yet in a meaningful way, but we're beginning to understand that there is a gut-brain relationship. We understand that if you don't keep, take care of your body, where are you going to live? I quote. And the microbiome is one of the most vast. And so this is what's living down in your gut and in your intestines. It's vast. I mean, you take pictures of it, you know, with these things where they collect all the different bacteria and the phages and the viruses and look at it. It changes. It's dynamic. It's really difficult to understand because there's so many variables there. But but as we change the microbiome, it changes uh, things like your symptoms may change, you know, both motor and non-motor. We don't completely understand that. There may be relationships to risk. So things like um, lactase and milk exposure and things like that might play into the microbiome. We know from animals, when we change the microbiome, we can improve symptoms. Could that be done in humans, we're definitely not anywhere close to understanding that. And we understand that there are things that are so severe and so disabling, like constipation, that they have to be paid attention to. So understanding what the diets are gonna be both symptomatically, and then for people who are at risk of getting Parkinson's disease, which diets are gonna be the best are gonna be important. So you're, you're gonna see a real, I would predict a real, um, um, you know, growth in this area over the next five years. Um, lots of investment, and I think it'll be really interesting. The other area to watch is the neuropsychiatric symptoms. These can be um, much more impactful, and we know from quality of life studies that, you know, depression uh, is considered and has been said to be the largest unmet hurdle in Parkinson, and yet it's very treatable, and people still sort of stray away from treating it, and we treat it wrong. Like we give an antidepressant and we tell people come back in six months and people that treat this know that this is not the way to do it. We should be seeing people back frequently and quickly adjusting the dose, making sure they're safe and getting them the right follow-up because this is actually a treatable feature and it's different than the types of depression that we see just in regular people that have major depression but don't have Parkinson's disease. And so this is biological, we know it happens because of changes in the brain. But even more than that, things like apathy, you know, not really wanting to get involved with things are actually more common than depression and can be disabling. 
And the one that we draw a lot of attention to in the book now is called demoralization. And that's where you may not be depressed, you may not be apathetic, but you may be, you know, giving up and feeling demoralized. And it can be treatable. And, and it doesn't matter what disease you have, whether it's Parkinson or something else, if you give up, if you get demoralized, it's going to be hard, you know, to really, um, to really live well with the disease. And we believe this is one that you should live well with. So really important to address many of these symptoms. And then finally, we talk about research. And so remember, it's PACT, prevent, advocate, care, and treat by development of new research. And people are waiting. I mean, this is not like something that we should be messing around with. There are a lot of people who have Parkinson's, the fastest growing disease, and we need to be developing treatments for people, but we are really underfunded. So in HIV, the National Institutes of Health, it's the largest funder of research in the world, funds at a level of $3 billion a year. And this funding has prevented thousands, if not millions, from ever developing HIV. But in Parkinson's disease, it's about 200 million. So it's actually way less than 10 times. And so you, you understand now, if you want to bend the trajectory or change the trajectory of the curve, you have to have better advocacy and more funding. And why should we fund? Well, they say, well, you have a treatment. You have these dopamine pills, right? That's the best treatment. However, the best treatment is still over 50 years old, and the treatment doesn't stop disease progression. And so we need to look at new things. And so we're beginning to target specific genes like the LARC2 gene and the GBA gene. We're looking at neuromodulation, changing how circuits work in the brain with deep brain stimulation and other um, types of therapies. We're looking at drugs to see if they can slow the disease or if they can have a a meaningful symptomatic benefit. And some of the drugs, um, like the ones you see on commercials, might be repurposed at some point. We're beginning to combine genetics and engineering and optics into these light-sensitive molecules, and we can really understand how the cells are firing in the circuits very, very, very carefully and in a way that that tells us how the circuits are working so we can point our therapies in the right places. And then you're probably gonna see more laboratory research and perhaps even clinical research into these designer receptors that are exclusively activated by designer drugs, so-called DREDs, that are used mostly in cancer therapies at this point in time. And finally, keep your eye on the inflammation story. So we know that there there are um, now lots of associations with inflammation, and part of this might be the gut, and, and we talked about the microbiome, but that vaccines have also been developed for Parkinson to try to increase that inflammatory response, and maybe that can clear these proteins, and will that be safe? A, will it have a symptomatic benefit for these uh, people with Parkinson? We don't know yet. And so will it make a hill of beans of difference if we clean the brain off of these uh, inclusions called Lewy bodies or not? So we don't know, but I think something super important to look at. And finally, what's going to be really important for the future is the development of biomarkers, something that can tell us about how Parkinson progresses when we give um, some sort of new therapy. We have to be able to prove that it's either slowing the disease progression or helping in some meaningful way. And we've had a great difficult time doing that. So we look at blood, we look at spinal fluid, we look at imaging. And so this is an imaging sequence by David Valancourt at the University of Florida, looking at one of these types of images that's now being used to track Parkinson disease. And if it can be shown to track the progression, we can decrease the number that we need to test a therapy from thousands to perhaps just several hundred. And so we actually, David and I just got a, a very large grant um, from the National Institutes of Health where we believe we've got, got to work with 21 Parkinson uh, study group centers to try to develop and test this biomarker because we need to develop these things and deploy them across centers. So with that, I promised you I wasn't going to talk the whole time. We were going to do questions and have a good time. 
feel free to tweet me at Michael Oaken. These are our books. Proceeds all go to charity. So um, this one's a bit old, the Parkinson 10 Secrets, but still an oldie but a goodie. This one is the, the Living with Parkinson has all the recipes and things with Irene Malati and myself. And so that's the more practical book. And if you want philosophy for your bedside reading, then a prescription for action, uh, ending Parkinson disease is the book that talks about polio and, and HIV and the pact. And we are trying, we're working with a group called the PD Avengers. And I hope you all go to the PD Avengers website and the Twitter page or type PD Avengers, the PD and then the word Avengers like the superhero and join that group, which is determined they're a grassroots effort growing out of this book to uh, get 1 million signatures uh, to try to drive the awareness and hopefully drive what we need to, uh, to make a big difference. So thanks for allowing me to speak. I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to stop the share here and take your questions. And I don't know if you want me to do them from the, the uh, questions that were submitted before or you'd like me to do them live, but yeah, I'm maybe, here. Maybe let's go. Um, thank you, Dr. Oaken, for that great presentation. Maybe uh, let's go with the questions uh, that we have so far. And I will also put them into the chat so that people can see the questions and, um, and go from there. And we have a few more that came in after, and I'm sure there are other people that want to ask their questions too. OK. Very good. So I'm going to just sort of roll through these. And, you know, if um, if you feel cheated in some way, um, uh, you know, by the length or whatever, feel free to, you know, shoot me a tweet or send me an email. You can, I'm, I work for a public university, so I don't have any um, stock in any of these companies. I do work as the medical director of the Parkinson's Foundation, which I think is just an awesome group. And we do have, I should mention, a group of nurses I've been working with for many years. They're best in class. They'll answer your questions 24 seven, maybe not 24 seven, but maybe eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, it's, a, it's a hotline, 1-800, the number four PD info, 1-800-4 PD info. And they're awesome. And, um, and if there's questions they can't answer, I meet with them once a month and we go over difficult questions and things. And so uh, if we can be of help, you know, sometimes these things, it's just too short to get into. Uh, please feel free to call our, our hotline or shoot me an email. So uh, Veronica asks, why does dyskinesia happen and what's the best way to treat it? So Veronica, we um, actually don't know all the answers to everything. I often say that every day that I practice medicine, I tell the students I know less. Every day I practice medicine, I know less. And so it's a, it's a humbling profession. I do know from my early days at Emory uh, 20 years ago and working with Malin DeLong, Stella Papa and that group, that there are profound changes in how different regions of the brain fire and talk to each other during dyskinesia. And we see the, uh, the firing rates change. We also know from recent information that, um, that how the brain oscillates or vibrates, that changes. And we can actually see this through some of the newer DBS electrodes, even some that are coming out on the market now, but we've been able to see this in our lab for many years. Um, so we think it's an interaction, you know, of abnormal conversations. There's also some theories about how sensitive things are because of the medications, but we now know that you shouldn't delay medications thinking you're going to get away with dyskinesia. We know from studies from Africa and from Italy and people that had, were not previously exposed that it's actually how long you've had the disease that predicts whether you're going to get the dyskinesia or not. The best ways to treat it, well, like I said, timing of the medication is super important. It's not just that. Sometimes simplifying to, to single uh, um, agents, so sometimes just using a cinnamon or Rotary-only strategy can be useful. For cases that are more severe, we use things like Duopa and deep brain stimulation. Okay, so Sheila asks, are there any new treatments, medications, clinical trials on the horizon to treat freezing of gait? Uh, well, we have one coming out where we were looking at, um, at, with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, we had a grant looking at the, uh, the PPN region. It's a new target in the bottom of the brainstem. Uh, it turns out that it did help somewhat for the freezing, and we've seen this with other uh, researchers like 
Tipu Aziz and Wesley Thabaston at uh, in um, Oxford and in Australia, but it's not a practical way to do this. And in fact, there there's such you know there's such disease progression and such um, risk of putting in that many leads into the brain that this is probably not the way to go. And I'll mention that um, there is a video game for those of you that like the old-fashioned arcades called Whack-a-Mole. And in Whack-a-Mole, you hit the you hit the the thing that pops up at you. And you know my kids love it. I have an 11 and a 12 year old. You hit the Whack-a-Mole, and then another one pops up, and you hit it. So when you hit freezing of gate with something like DBS, the other one that pops up. Is, um, is balance. So it doesn't treat the balance. And so sometimes you get the freezing improved and then you get the balance. And so it's really tricky. So people have looked at neuromodulation, people have looked at different medicines and there's been um, different responses from things like memory drugs. So people think if you can pay attention better, your, um, your, your freezing might get better. So people have looked at amphetamines and everything, but not huge responses and not responses in everyone. Some people respond to cueing and then about a third of people who get DBS for unknown reasons, either STN, subthalamic nucleus, or GPI improve and they're freezing, but not everyone. And of course, if you make the freezing go away, it doesn't address the balance, which could be the following issue. So it's tricky, a lot of work still to be um, done there. Um, Betty talks about taking 50 milligrams of cinnamon, which is a really small dose, three times a day experiencing mild dyskinesias and wondering if it's a result of the cinnamon. Initially, I wasn't experiencing dyskinesias or anything I can do. So, um, so if, the, if the dose is a 50 slash 200, so the 50 is called carbidopa and the 200 is called levodopa, then you can actually switch to a regular release and take a lower dose. If it's truly 50 milligrams, Hard to get to 50 milligrams, you, you, you'd have to take a 25, 100 and flip it in half. If you're already getting dyskinesia, and actually, Betty, many women get dyskinesia a little more than men in this situation. Lower body weights can be associated, you know, with this. And what we call this is brittle dyskinesia. We've written about this a number of times. It's like brittle diabetes, we call it brittle Parkinson, where tiny dosages, even you take a half of a tablet or a quarter of a tablet and you just you, know, you, you just touch somebody and they get very dyskinetic. When we see that um, in these tiny dosages, um, most of these people do well with GPI DBS, okay? Even more so than STN. And some people with subthalamic DBS will actually worsen you know after this not to say it may not work but gpi seems to be you know like one of the things of interest uh for that and then duopa can help with dyskinesia as can changing formulations you know and playing around so there's a whole bunch of things you can do for uh for dyskinesia um darcy darcy i know darcy for many years how are you darcy um i see you there um so um I caught Darcy's ear uh, in one of the webinars. We've been online a whole bunch of times with Facebook Lives and things with information on coronavirus and living with Parkinson and just trying to keep people informed uh, since March. You know, I've been on more than I have in my whole career. And so we're, we're, we're out there. And I caught Darcy's ear because um, I said, if you have deep brain stimulation, you should be paying attention to depression, anxiety, and other issues as being super um, important. And, um, and, and Darcy wants to know, you know, namely speech and other things and what's going on with that. So I'll just say um, what's super important to know is, is that so many people focus on the motor symptoms, tremor, stiffness, slowness, dyskinesia, uh, you know, these, these fluctuations with DBS, and it's very powerful for those things. But if you re reduce the medicines too much, and in some people you shouldn't reduce the medicines at all, if you're too aggressive with medication reduction and you're not, not seeing people regularly, some people could develop um, de severe depressions, occasionally even ideation for suicide from, and a lot of times from reducing the meds too much, too much apathy. Now we had this great debate, we call it a transoceanic debate between um, the Americans and the French, right? So 
Europeans and the Americans going back and forth in the literature. Because early on when DBS first came out, the Europeans and the French in particular would stop all the medicines. Now actually the French have published subsequently studies showing exactly what happens. And so they, they answered their question. I like to say in the debate, of course, you get my biased point of view that, that many people get apathetic, their walking gets worse, their Parkinson gets worse. And so I say, it's kind of like if you're climbing Mount Everest and you needed oxygen to get to the next level or granola bar or power bar, why would you not you know, give that if you needed it? And so it's super important that we are not just you know, fixing or, or, or bringing in a powerful way the symptomatic effects of the motor treatments. It's probably more important that your team is watching depression, anxiety, and other issues, demoralization, apathy after the DBS, um, more so than even the motor symptoms and people forget that. So it's, it's really um, important. Teresa asks, what are the best exercises for Parkinson disease? Well, we don't know. Um, not to be glib, uh, many people say the best exercise is the one that you're willing to do and to do every day. Um, I like to say, you know, you should sweat. If you're not sweating, you're probably not doing enough exercise. You want to get your heart rate up. If you're doing too much exercise, and I have some super exercisers, you get tired the next day. If it's tiring you out the next day, you know, consistently you're doing too much. You need to back off. Some people that do the forced exercise actually tire themselves out. It's not for everyone. So it's not a one size fits all. The good, good news is, is we're seeing benefits in everything from Tai Chi to, um, to, to uh, aerobic training, to weight training, stretching's uh, useful. And so, so keeping up a regimen where you're doing something every day is important. And, um, and hopefully we're gonna learn now. There are several studies. There was one that was just funded by to start looking at this to see which ones are gonna be um, better uh, than others. Um, Jody asks about uh, evidence that a smaller dose of carbidopa, levodopa, half a tablet can delay the onset of dyskinesia, motor fluctuations. Jody, great question. Answer is no. We now know that that um, that uh, delaying the medication that you need, you're just making yourself suffer for uh, without a benefit. You're not going to get a gold medal at the end of this journey. And we now know that because we studied people who had no access to uh, Parkinson's disease medications that were then started on them. And so we know the key element is disease duration. And then if you get dyskinesia, you were gonna get dyskinesia anyway, okay? You're, you need to have the right treatments, you know, like we talked about, you know, people working with you to get the right cocktail of timing of medicines and, and, um, and maybe other, other features and so, no gold medal for, uh, for giving yourself less. And in fact, the people that I've seen the greatest tragedies with, in fact, somebody from California I saw comes to mind, but I've seen several tragedies in physicians who um, have Parkinson. And there, there's an old term by a very famous physician called Osler, William Osler, it said a physician who treats him, him or herself as a fool. And, uh, and so you see physicians that don't want to give themselves any medicine and they torture themselves. And by the time they figure it out, they've lost a lot of good years of living. So we don't want that to happen to anybody anymore. And we call that levodopa or dopamine agonist um, phobia. So there's a lot on the Parkinson Foundation website. I've written about this for, for many years, but the evidence continues to mount. Um, and so I would not, uh, I wouldn't delay uh, those medicines or take lower medicines. I would take what you need. Um, handling excessive sweating problems with thermoregulation, tough, tough issue. Uh, a lot of times when you turn people on, not to, you know, like, don't mean that in a, in a <laughs> literal sense, but when you turn people on with the medicines, when you're on, you'll sweat less. A lot of times it's an off phenomenon or an on-off phenomenon. And one of the things we've also noticed with DBS and Duopa is, is um, sometimes people don't realize they're going on and off and they can have non-motor fluctuations and motor fluctuations and sweating. And so if you find that when you're on, you're getting less sweating, sometimes using Duopo or DBS or some other therapy might be useful or taking medicines more frequently um, could, be, could be useful. Um, you can inject, uh, by the way, just FYI, you can inject Botox into the sweat glands, into the 
subcutaneous of the hand. So people, some people have really bad hand sweating and there's a disease that causes that. And some people are really terrible sweaters. And, um, and so if there's a specific region of the body that really bothers you, sometimes we can put Botox into that region, uh, interestingly. Um, also gets the wrinkles too, if you have wrinkles in that region. Okay. Okay. Um, in the book and literature, um, sexual functioning is only addressed in terms of erectile dysfunction. What about the, the female sexual response? Great question. So um, several uh, centers within the Parkinson Foundation Centers of Excellence have begun to, uh, to research this. <clears throat> Probably the, the most <clears throat> advanced information is coming out of Israel and Nir Jaladi's group. So if you look up Nir Jaladi, D G I L A D A D I A. We can send it to you near Giladi, G I L A D I I Giladi. Um, he is in um, Tel Aviv, and he's a tremendous researcher. But on his team, he was the first group that we saw that put a sexual therapist on the team, and so they begun to to address these really critical issues that happen in women as well as in men, and so. I think they're still at the beginning stages of, of you know, what can be done, but, uh, but they're reporting some really good results. And so we'll keep our eye on that. I don't want to, um, don't want to represent myself as an expert there, but, but certainly that would be the center I would direct you to look for information. Um, Barbara talks about overcoming your freezing a gate. It's a real problem. So again, I think we covered that a little bit before, but let me just say important to, um, optimize medication, make sure you're not under medicated or over medicated. And sometimes you have to push up to getting dyskinesia to make sure that at the higher dose, your, your walking may not be better in one out of every hundred people, higher dosages may actually make you freeze, but that's a very rare one or two people out of every hundred. So getting the medicines right, you know, with that part of your team is important. And then having your physical therapy team, look at whether cueing helps and there are lots of cueing strategies that can be done. So it's a combination between those two. And, and again, for unknown reasons um, that are not totally clear to us now, about a third of people after DBS get improvements in freezing, but not in balance and in falling. So, so we've still got a long way um, to go. Um, Terry wants to know about progress being made on treating dyskinesias uh, aside from DBS and amantadine. DBS seems to carry with it some increased apathy and depression and patients who are mild cognitively impaired. Totally agree with all of that. And, um, and I think that there are several drugs that are being looked at now. So I think that's gonna be the next avenue. We can now see the dyskinesia spike in some of the patients in the physiology we're reading out of the brain system. So people who have implantable brain systems, it tends to suppress the dyskinesia really well. So we're understanding it better. And if we could get better targeted drugs, there's been several tried, but nothing new that has been awesome for dyskinesia. So like, for example, the adenosine A2A antagonist, estradepheline, neuriance that just came on the market might actually cause more dyskinesia, may keep you on a little more. But it, so, so again, different receptors in different areas might be the answer. And so we need to see where that's going, but, but nothing, nothing like pressing that I would tell you about right now. Do some of the Parkinson's medications cause constipation and what's the best thing used to prevent it on a daily basis? My husband was just in the ER for this problem. Um, we don't know like how much the Parkinson medications contribute to the constipation, but I have had a few patients where um, it can be uh, considerable. And as we adjust the medications to lower dosages, it might be helpful. So it is something to always consider, although I don't think that's in the majority of people. I would say constipation is one of the most disabling symptoms that you can have from Parkinson. And we treat it with, um, we use our dietitians, we, we give a nutritional plan, we uh, try different medications with our gastroenterologists. And we also now recognize that when you look at biopsies uh, from the colon and from the intestines, that we see these Lewy bodies uh, that are uh, actually in the membranes. And so we know the Parkinson is, uh, is affecting it. Super important to get on a good regimen and to work with nutritionists along with gastroenterologists and neurologists. And we don't do as good of a job uh, doing this. Up on our website um, at the Fixel, I work 
for the Fixo Institute for Neurological Diseases at the University of Florida. And up on our website, we have um, a constipation formula we've recommended to patients for years. And I was just um, on the phone with somebody today with very severe constipation. So it can be, uh, it, it's a tough one. And, and there have been some recent trials. There's a drug called Amitiza that, um, that was trialed for Parkinson. And there's a few other in that class different drugs called Gorellans and others. We've written some review articles about them, but we need to have more trials. There was one that was tested by the Parkinson study group, but didn't come out uh, particularly positive. Um, Barbara asks, the best indicators for progression of PD? So many variations. Well, so that's, and it's gonna be important, Barbara, because as we move into the next generation, you know, we're going to have to understand the phenotypes, the different, you know, it's not just Parkinson disease, it's many Parkinson diseases. So everybody on this call may actually have a different disease and understanding how to deliver precision medicine for the few that may have genetic problems like LARC2 or GBA, other subtypes, we're going to have to do better at understanding those. The indicators for progression, we don't know. We're looking at that in the Parkinson Outcome Project and the Parkinson Foundation and also um, I think I mentioned David Valancourt has this large grant to look at imaging as a way, but there are lots of things, imaging blood, saliva, lots of people looking at not just diagnostic predictors, but how things progress. And if you can predict how things progress, remember I told you that with that trick, then we can test less people on all these new therapies to see if they really work. If we don't have a measure for disease progression, it takes thousands and thousands of people to see if these things actually work. So having that measure and the reason we go so aggressively at that measure is important. And what are my thoughts on the, uh, the, the uh, polyvagal theory and how it relates to Parkinson disease? I, I don't have very many thoughts. I will tell you there are some you know, interesting literature uh, there are some interesting papers about the vagus nerve and Parkinson's disease and Parkinson starting in the gut and moving forward. And then people who have had vagotomies and their later risk for Parkinson's disease. Um, and, uh, and so it's interesting. So with that, we're sitting right at 630. So um, I think our hour is about expired. And um, I think we got to everybody's question that was pre submit it and uh, it's certainly been an honor to be with the Silicon Valley group. Wow. Well, yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking your time out to answer all those questions yeah, and for the nice presentation. Go ahead. Lisa. We do have a couple of questions in the chat if you have the time, but we are, um, we are, yeah, we're respectful of 630. Yeah, your East time. Coast time. Yeah. 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 So I've got to go do homework with my kid. Absolutely. I go okay. with some I think I've got history and math. <laughs> okay. All right. That's thank you. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. For those of you who don't know us, we are Lisa and Steph, and we are PD Connect. We offer exercise via Zoom Monday through Friday, and we'd love for you all to join us and check us out. We do exercise and education. We're all about mind, body, and community. And we want to thank you so much, Dr. Oaken, um, from us at PD Connect and the Silicon Valley Parkinson's Women's Support Group. Um, <laughs> That is Sarah and Darcy and many other women and that Susan. are on this call. And mm -hmm. Susan, yes. So thank you so if much. You pass, if you pass my email, you know, if anybody wants to, their question didn't get answered, I swear I'm really good at uh, <laughs> questions and I'll get to you. So if you did want to email me, feel free to email me or send me a Twitter message. And then if you end up uh, purchasing any of the books, we'll send those proceeds to Parkinson Charity and sign the sign the pact you know for a million people and leave us reviews up on amazon because we got to get more people seeing so we can we can advocate and keep it going it's going to take your your grassroots efforts to make this happen so that's why i love this group the pd avengers i love the your silicon valley group and i've loved interacting with uh, many of you including darcy and others and so um so i wish i had another hour with you but feel free to contact me it's just been an honor to be with you. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Yeah. And we'll ask for a poem next time too. <laughs> well, happy to give you that's that's my least best selling book is the is the book of poetry. <laughs> well, but my favorite. So I'm happy to happy to do poems next time. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Have yeah. a good night. Thank Bye. you guys for coming. We're stopping now.